And what is so depressing about academia in general, I have to say, is that there are not people around who are really prepared to go for it. I mean, when all of those economists wrote that nice little thing to the Queen and kind of said, we miss systemic risk, and you'd say, hello, are you going to tell me about systemic risk then? Do I ever see any analysis of that? No, not at all. Somebody had a spreadsheet somewhere and said, oh, well, there was some risk in the mortgage market or something, something like that. There is a real intellectual problem here. And while changing ideas doesn't change the world by itself, because all of the other moments have to change, you can't change the world without changing ideas. And when people ask me, are, you going to get out, are we going to get out of this crisis just the way it was before? And I say, well, if academics continue in the way they are, the answer is yes. They're still teaching the same ridiculous neoclassical economics class, classes, the same kind of, you know, stuff in rational choice and political, you know, I mean, all that kind of rubbish. <laughs> they're still doing that. And, and, and all they're doing in the business schools is sort of adding a little, little course on business ethics. I'm just gonna make it. <laughs> either, either, either that, or, or even more sinisterly, what they're doing is creating courses on how to make money out of other people's bankruptcies. So there's an intellectual problem. I, I'm, I'm not able to work across all those other mo moments, as it were. I'm able to work on mental conceptions of the world. So what I'm appealing to you is, for God's sake, be prepared to shake up your mental conceptions of the world and think about something different in relationship to how to understand the current situation and the likely outcomes that will follow from actually continuing on the status quo, which we are actually doing right now. When I said that the neoliberal trick which came up in the 1980s was to save the banks and suck it to the people. Isn't that exactly what they're doing right now? And furthermore, you would think the bankers would have some shame and say, I'm not going to make $3 billion in one year, I mean, or and take bonuses of billions, you know, but they're doing it. And isn't it time? What I want to do is just put on the table what it is we should be discussing instead of, you know, going back into one of those ridiculous courses when, when you, you know, well, I won't get into that. But I better, at this point, I think I better shut up. So thanks very much. talk a bit about Bill Gates. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not terribly interested in that one. But, uh, what's, what's interesting about Bill Gates uh, is his foundations. And actually, if you look at all of those foundations by Gates and Soros and so on, you see that actually what they're doing is they're defining a new R&D frontier, which is in biomedical engineering and genetic engineering and all those kinds of things. That is likely, I think they're trying to turn that into the next bubble, if you want to call it that. Uh, in other words, this is the, a new innovation wave which they're trying to, and of course they're doing it all about human good, you know, uh, contributions to humanity that can be made by, uh, by the, this uh, research. So that's a lot of what they're uh, attempting to do as, as the state withdraws somewhat from as, uh, defining the R&D effort, except, of course, still in the military <coughs> realm. Uh, so we're getting the private foundation stepping in and defining the next research frontier. So that's a bit about what Gates is, is, is up to. On the individualism question, yeah, I mean, but there have been many periods when people, you know, the individualism gets, uh, gets modified in certain ways, and I'm not, I'm not entirely against some sort of individualistic activities. I think it's fine. But the question is, how is it locked into uh, political work, and in what ways does political work uh, actually uh, offset some of the negative sides? One of the most distressing things, I think, uh, that comes out of the neoliberal era, which has been preaching this the gospel of personal responsibility for everything, is that the majority of people who've been foreclosed upon in the United States do not blame the system at all. They blame themselves but somehow or other they weren't personally responsible enough or something happened to them uh, that uh, an accident happened to their kid and they got heavy medical expenses or something like that. So getting the idea that there's a systemic problem behind this 
and that it needs a systemic politics and a systemic solution is actually very hard given the way in which many people have responded. At this point, I've been very surprised, you know, how millions of people have lost their homes and there's been no, you know, huge social movement of the dispossessed <coughs> around that. There are signs it's beginning, but it's only just, just beginning. So, yeah, there's a big issue there, uh, which has to do with the fact that, you know, when Margaret Thatcher was at her height, she basically declared that her, her task was to change the soul of people. And to some degree she succeeded. And I think there's a sense in which we're all neoliberal now without altogether all knowing it. And then that's one of the ways in which self-critique and I think social critique becomes, becomes crucial. First, I would like to thank you very much for your lecture. Um, my main question is a very simple question. Um, you use the word they a lot, and I'm just wondering who really is they, and what is they, and how are they able to do what you say they're able to do? Thank you. Well, you know, I don't, I don't have uh, too much difficulty with that question. Um, it was pretty clear to me uh, from all of the evidence I assembled from the 1970s uh, that they was constituted by, you know, you can find organizational forms like uh, the Business Roundtable, uh, the US Chambers of Commerce, uh, the Political Action Committees, uh, all of which uh, were actually linked together and through a political process uh, with a political agenda. And if you go to the celebrated K Street in Washington, you'll say, see who they are. And, and uh, it's not, it, it, like I say, it's just not too hard. Now, you can take an individual and say, well, I'm not sure whether that individual is with them or with us, you know, I mean, I don't know. And there are lots of, there are some people within the financial services industry who actually, uh, sotto voce, will agree with me. I mean, they would never say it publicly, but they, they, they do. So there are um, what uh, Ananya Roy calls double agents within the system. So and that's very helpful because they can feed you information that you need. So, but I, I don't think they is a is a is a big issue. I mean, I know who dominates economic decisions in a city like Baltimore. Uh, it's pretty clear who dominates decisions on Wall Street. Um, and uh, and one of the points I make in the in the book is that the, since the 16th century onwards, something is formed which I call the state finance nexus, which is usually hidden from view. And it's that point at which the state and money and finance are so intimately related that you really can't tell the difference. Now, I don't know if you noticed in the crisis, it was very interesting being in the United States. Who appeared on television in the midst of the crisis? Bernanke and Paulson. We didn't see the president anywhere. The Secretary of State had disappeared. Everybody else, they were coming out and making all the decisions. There's your state finance nexus. The US Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve. And, and they're creating key decisions. For instance, they're subsidizing the banks. The banks can go to the Federal Reserve and, and, and borrow at zero, month, zero interest. Right? They can then lend out even at 5%. I mean, this is the state actually subsidizing the banks, hugely. And that is what the state finance nexus is about. It's about supporting the finance and, and, and so on. So I don't have any difficulty looking for those institutional arrangements which are signals. Now, generally speaking, the Federal Reserve sits in the background and, you know, blah, blah, and has its open market, you know, and every now and again uh, they talk and the Treasury talks, uh, you know. So they'd like to remain rather out of sight, and as any ruling elite would want to do, don't want to draw attention to yourself. But boy, in that crisis, they really drew, drew attention to themselves and what they were about. You will see exactly the same thing when, when the South Korea bailout occurred in 1987-98. Who was there? Head of the IMF was in one room. The, the US, head of the US Treasury was in the other room. 
Same thing happened with the Mexico.